Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Joseph Cotton and Valley in Spellbound. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. While most people think of motion pictures as typically American, it's nevertheless true that our neighbors overseas have contributed much to their development in new ideas, new technical approaches, and new stars. And one of the most exciting new stars to come out of Europe is that great Italian artist known as Valley. She's heard tonight in her first dramatic appearance on the air. And we've chosen as her co-star another truly fine performer, Joseph Cotton. And a great play for them both, David O. Selznick's thrilling screen hit, Spellbound. I was talking to Valley during our rehearsals about her plans and her impressions of America. And one of the things that impressed her on arriving in this country was the abundance of everything, from motor cars to good soap flakes. And to millions of people, good soap flakes mean lux, which reminds me again how much we take our luxuries for granted. While in many other countries, housewives must rely on any kind of soap that they can get, here they're always sure of a safe and easy care for precious washable fabrics just by saying Lux. It's curtain time, and here's act one of Spellbound, starring Joseph Cotton as John and Valley as Constance. In the secluded Vermont countryside is an old established sanatorium, Green Manors, noted for its treatment of mental disorders. On the staff of psychiatrists is a young woman, Dr. Constance Peterson. May I come in, Dr. Peterson? Dr. Murchison, of course. I thought I'd spread the tidings. My successor, Dr. Edwards, will be arriving here any moment. I, I just can't imagine Grand Manors without you, Dr. Murchison. I sort of go with the fixtures, I suppose. It's so much more than that. You are Green Manners. Well, the old must make way for the new, Miss Constance. Particularly when the board of directors suspects the old of senility. But you've been like a new man since your vacation. <laughs> of course, I agree with you. You were overworked. Charming diagnosis for a broken-down horse. You're not leaving today. I, I mean, just because oh, Dr. Edwards... Oh, I shall you... hover around for a day or two. Well, I'd better check the rest of the staff. I'd like you all in my office at four to meet him. Uh, Dr. Murchison, tell me... What do you think of that, Dr. Edwards? His reputation is tremendous. Like the rest of you, I've never met the man. What's your hurry, Connie? Oh, Dr. Fleroff, I just had a note from Dr. Edwards. He wants to see me. Oh? He's been here all of 24 hours and he's writing you notes? He's interested in one of my patients. Oh, you mean Mr. Garms, the one with the guilt complex? Yes. Hmm. I think you have a guilt complex yourself. Oh? Take last night at dinner. A dimple appeared in your cheek that was never there before. I detect decided amorous outcroppings toward Dr. Edwards. If you knew how he'd test that sort of high school talk. Ah, but how were you to know that Dr. Edwards would turn out to be so young and handsome? Is that all you have to say about him? No. No, he's a strange man. Jealous of him? Maybe. I mean, of his position here. He seems so unsure of himself. As you pointed out, he's been here only a day. Please, he's waiting for me. Sure. Just see the conversation is confined to your patient. <laughs> Don't take me too seriously, Connie. Of course, I haven't had time really to study Mr. Garn's case, Dr. Peterson, but I gather he's thoroughly convinced that he killed his father. Yes, Dr. Edwards. Actually, his father died a very natural death. But his conviction is, is very curious. But you've encountered such cases very often. You describe them so perfectly in your book. Yes, uh, my, my book, I... Look, would you mind doing me a favor? Not at all, Doctor. I, 
I have a headache, and I understand you're not on duty till after dinner. Well, I... Now, please, I... I need some fresh air, and you look as though it might do you some good, too. Excuse me. Hello? Yes, this is Dr. Edwards. Who? Sorry, I... I don't get your name. Norma Kramer? Uh, please, Miss Kramer, I'm very busy, and I don't know you. I... I assure you, I... I'm sorry, Miss Kramer. Someone claiming to be... Well, I don't like practical jokes, do you? Maybe an ex-patient of yours. They can be rather coy at times. Let's get out of here. We'll look at some sane trees, normal grass, and clouds without complexes. How about it? Thanks. I'd love to. How do you like our landscape, Dr. Edwards? Pastoral enough? Breathtaking, but you're changing the subject. We were talking about poetry, and you were about to say... I was about to say that great harm has been done to the human race by the men who write it. Oh, not really. The way they delude people about love. Writing about it as if it were a symphony, a flight of angels. Which it isn't, of course. Certainly not. People fall in love, as they put it, because they respond to certain hair colorings or vocal tones. Mm. Or mannerisms that remind them of their parents. Oh, sometimes for no reason at all. The point is that people read about love as one thing. And experience is quite another. They expect kisses to be like lyrical poems and embraces like Shakespearean drama. And when they find out to the contrary, they get sick and have to be analyzed. Yes, hmm? very often. Professor, you're suffering from Mogo on the go-go. I beg your pardon? <laughs> Come on, let's sit down over there. I see just what you were looking for. Trees, grass, and clouds. All very normal. Well, Florent, seen our new chief of staff today? No, Graf, I guess he's been tied up with Dr. Murchison. Dr. Murchison just told me he went walking with Dr. Peterson. <laughs> That's a little odd, isn't it? Oh, it'll do Constance good. Poor girl's withering away with science. In my opinion, she's... Oh, well, come in, Connie. We hate to talk about you behind your back. Oh, I, Have I, a lovely walk. I just got back. I heard Mr. Gams became quite ill this afternoon. Uh, yes, I, I gave him a sedative. Oh, I should have been here. I'm sorry. Oh, looks like you've had quite a time. Notice her stockings, Dr. Graff. The lady's been climbing trees. Or uh, lolling in a briar patch. Oh, now, don't be angry, Constance. Come on. Have some coffee. Dr. Peterson's already eaten. Observe the mustard on the right forefinger. I'd say uh, hot dogs on the state highway. It's a pity you are not able to diagnose your patients as accurately. I'm sorry to leave this nursery, but I'd better look in on Mr. Garbs. Why, I believe she was blushing, Fleur. Oh, yes, I, I'm sure she was. Peterson. I... It's very late, I know. Am I disturbing you? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, how's Gar? I saw him at 10.30. He seemed much better. Good. I, I came to ask if... I may borrow your book. The one on guilt complexes. Dr. Murchison had a copy. Oh, oh yes, it's here on the shelf. The autograph to this. What do you want with the book? If there's a problem you want to discuss... What... Oh, no particular problem. I'd like very much to discuss your book, though. I've never discussed an author's work with him. I sound nervous, don't I? Mm -hmm. Are you? I'm amazed at my subterfuge. I don't want to discuss your book at all. It's ridiculous. My coming here like a distracted child. You're lovely. Please don't say that. You'll think I'm here to... I know why you're here. Why? Because something's happened to us. But it doesn't happen like that in a day. It happens in a moment sometimes. I felt it this afternoon. It's like lightning striking. It was... What is it? Why are you looking at me like that? Eh. Eh. Something about your dress. My dress? Oh, forgive me. I... I've been having a rather bad time with my nerves lately. Your dress, I mean those... I mean those dark stripes. You're no, ill. No, I'm all right. I... I... Hello? Yes, Dr. Graff. Yes. What? Where is he? I'll be there right away. 
Mr. Garms just tried to commit suicide. Is it bad? Taking him to surgery. I'll go with you. Wait. Why are the lights out in the corridor? Well, they're always off this time it's of night. It's dark. That's why he did it, because the lights are out. Doctor, Turn Hedges. on the lights in the doors. Unlock the doors. You can't keep people in cells. You are, you little Fools, Doctor. all of you babbling about guilt complexes. What do you know about them? Turn on the lights. Turn on... understand this at all. What would make Dr. Edwards collapse? I, I don't know, Dr. Edwards. Mm, probably shock of some kind brought on by exhaustion. May I stay with him, Doctor? You were there when it happened. Yes, I, I'm sure he'll be more at ease with you. And Mr. Garms? Oh, he'll be all right. Uh, just take care of Dr. Edwards and uh, keep him quiet. I wish you wouldn't talk, Dr. Edwards. Please just rest. I, I must talk. Very well, then. You're not Dr. Edwards, are you? You know. Only that you're not who you pretend you are. And that you're ill. How did you find out? This morning you sent me a note. You wanted to see me about Mr. Garms. You signed the note. Tonight when I took the book off the shelf, the autograph book, the signatures, Doctor, completely different. Dr. Edwards is dead. Dead? I ought to know I killed him and took his place. Then who are you? I don't, I don't know. I have no memory. If you remember killing Dr. Edwards, you can remember more. I can't. I've, I've tried. I... You... You afraid of me? No. Loss of memory isn't a difficult problem. Amnesia. Trick of the mind to forget something too horrible to remember, so you put it behind a closed door. We'll have to open that door. I know what's behind it. A murder. I don't believe it. That's a delusion of your illness. Will you answer me truthfully and trust me? I trust you. I, it's no use. I don't know who I am. I, I, I don't know. Who telephoned today? Telephone. Yes, while I was in the office. What did she say? She said that she was my office assistant. She hadn't heard from me. She was worried. You mean she was Dr. Edwards' assistant? What else did she say? She didn't recognize my voice. She said I wasn't Dr. Edwards. Was that your, the first time that you became confused about being Edwards? Did anything happen before that? Yes, in the hotel room, packing to come here. I found this cigarette case in my coat. Here, the initials. J.B. They're probably your initials. J.B. John Brown's body. Do they hang murderers on a sour apple tree here in Vermont? Oh, please. Try to rest. It's very late. You'll feel better tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Hello? Yes, this is Dr. Murchison. Who? Oh, yes, Miss Kramer. You what? Well, of course. Come over right away. Who? Very well, then. Bring the sheriff with you. I wanted Dr. Fleurot here when you came, Miss Kramer. I wanted him to hear your story, too. You see, technically, I'm no longer associated with this sanatorium. I don't see what difference it makes. None, perhaps, Sheriff. Uh, go on, Miss Kramer. I've been in Dr. Edwards' office for years, and the man who spoke to me on the telephone is not Dr. Edwards. He let me have my vacation when he left on his, but I was very worried when I didn't hear from him. Then I thought he might have come directly here. That's why I telephoned. Show them that photograph of Dr. Edwards. Oh. Oh, yes. Yes. Here. That certainly isn't our Dr. Edwards. What do you suppose made him break down last night? It's obvious now. Garms, that uh, patient I told you about. I'm almost certain our Dr. Edwards is an amnesia case. Garms brought him back to reality for an instant, and being unable to face the truth of who he was... He collapsed. You think he may have killed the real Dr. Edwards, eh? It's quite possible. And then took his place to conceal the crime. Uh, this sort of unrealistic act is typical of the short-sighted cunning that goes with paranoid behavior. But uh, we're wasting our time. His room's on the next floor. Come in. Oh, good morning, Dr. Murchison. Dr. Ferro, is... Is anything wrong? I'm afraid so, Constance. Oh, uh, this gentleman with us is the sheriff. Sheriff? 
Uh, Dr. Edwards turns out to be a paranoid imposter, very likely guilty of having murdered the real Edwards. But he's disappeared. Disappeared? He is not in his room? We've looked everywhere, Connie. You left him in his room, miss. When? Uh, late last night, but... Well, he may still be around here somewhere. Excuse me, I better phone for some deputies. Don't worry, Connie. It's not your fault that he got away. They're bound to find him. I don't agree, Dr. Fleurot. I don't think they will find him. Not alive. Why not? An amnesic case like this? With the police after him? The fellow will put an end to his pain, to his nightmare fantasies, by blowing out his brains or dropping out of a window. No. Why? I didn't mean to be so callous about it, Constance. Your guess is probably quite accurate. Come along, Floro. Suicide. No. No. Hello? Uh, Mr. Brown is calling you, Dr. Peterson. Brown? John Brown, doctor. Long distance. Put him on, please. Hello? Where are you? Doesn't matter. You'll find a note under your carpet. Thanks for trying. Hello? Hello? I cannot involve you in this for many reasons. One of them being that I love you. When the police step in, tell them I'm at the Riverside Hotel in New York. I prefer to wait alone for the end. In just a moment, we'll return with Act Two of Spellbound. Libby, you're practically bubbling over with excitement. What's up? Well, who wouldn't be excited about a picture that brings Van Johnson and June Allison together again? They're such a wonderful romantic team. What a picture they have this time. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's rollicking new comedy, The Bride Goes Wild. <laughs> rollicking is right. Van and June get involved in some of the most hilarious situations I've seen in many moons. June Allison proves herself a top comedian in that picture. And Van Johnson was never in better form as the young author trying to avoid matrimony. But he can't escape a girl as lovely as June Allison. Oh, she makes a stunning bride. The studio designed a trousseau for her that any bride would envy. Well, nowadays, it's easy for a bride to keep her nice things new-looking longer. The same way MGM did for June Allison in The Bride Goes Wild. With Lux Care. And easier than ever now, with the wonderful new diamonds of Lux. Women said Lux just couldn't be better, but it's more wonderful than ever. There's nothing just like these new diamonds, so sheer, so tiny, so white. They not only look different, they act different. They're so much faster. They fairly burst into suds at the touch of water. And make the richest suds ever. Just compare them with any other suds you've ever used. They're richer. And they keep pretty under things lovely three times as long. Tests show that. It's just like getting three pretty slips for the price of one. So smart girls avoid harsh washing methods. Anything safe in water is safe in these new diamonds of Lux. We return you now to William Keeley. Act two of Spellbound, starring Joseph Cotton as John and Valley as Constance. <laughs> It's late that same day, in a room in the Riverside Hotel in New York City. How did you come here? Why? To take care of you. To help you. You can't help a criminal. I won't allow you to. I couldn't bear it away from you. I couldn't do anything but think oh, of you. No, 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 no. I'm here as your doctor. It has nothing to do with love. Hmm. Nothing at all. Hmm? Oh, darling. Darling. Constant. You see... Nothing to do with love at all. <laughs> Darling, we haven't much time. You lived somewhere. You had relatives, friends. Please try to remember. Why not a wife? Can you remember her? No, no, thank heavens I can't remember a wife. You told me you had headaches. How would you diagnose a pain in the right upper quadrant? A persistent pain? Oh, gallbladder, possibly a heart case, pneumonia. Depends on the patient's history. Obviously, you are a doctor. The only thing that's obvious is the logic of the situation. What logic? That it was I who was with Dr. Edwards here. Look at this newspaper. 
Police believe the imposter who escaped from Green Manors is the patient who visited the real Dr. Edwards in the Cumberland Mountains. No trace of Dr. Edwards has been found since he left the Cumberland Resort in the company of his alleged patient. Where did you go? I don't know. But I came back with his identity. And logically, I know why the body hasn't been found. Because it was hidden by me. Don't you see you can be imagining all this? You insist without proof that you're a murderer. Whoever you are, it's a guilt complex that speaks for you. A guilt fantasy that probably goes back to your childhood. Your wrist. What about my wrist? Roll up your sleeve. You were in an accident. Your wrist was burned. Your forearm. You've had an operation in the last six months. A skin graft. Yes. It hurts. What happened? Where? My wrist hurts. What happened? It's burning. My arm's burning. Try. Try to remember. No, I can't think. I can't. I... <sighs> Darling. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are you all right? Oh, I, I'm all right. Who could that be? Uh, the bellboy. I left word I wanted the late editions of the newspapers. I'll go. Well, boy, Mr. Brown. Oh, yes, the papers. Here, thank you. Huh? Oh. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thanks. Still on the front page? Yes, it's my picture. Your picture. Police hunt Dr. Constance Peterson, believed aiding madman in Edward's mystery. The bellboy recognized me. We've got to leave here. Now, at once. There's no time even to pack. You told the cab driver Pennsylvania Station. Yes, darling, yes. Listen, when you left the Cumberland Mountains, Dr. Edwards was with you. You went somewhere else, together. By automobile, I, I doubt it. The newspaper would have mentioned it. By plane, maybe. Or by train. However you went, you bought tickets. You must have heard Dr. Edwards ask for tickets. I, I, I don't remember. But you will. We'll go to a ticket window. Try to relive that other time with Edwards. Ask for the same tickets. I'll, I'll try, I'll try. All right, please. Who is next? Washington, one way. You went someplace with Edwards. Ask for tickets to the same place. 46, including tax. Thank you. Yes, sir. Tickets. Tickets to where, sir? Two tickets. Two tickets where to? Rome. Rome. Where? He, he means Rome, Georgia. Yes, ma'am. Just a moment, please. I, I feel so pe peculiar. Please, darling. A policeman is coming. Don't say anything. Anything wrong, lady? My, my husband, seal officer. Here you are, ma'am. Two tickets to Rome, Georgia. You need any help? Oh, no, he'll be all right. Those dizzy spells go away quickly. Your change, ma'am. Birmingham Special, track 17 in 10 minutes. Thank you. I'll go to the train with you. Oh, no, he's better now, officer. Please don't bother. Track 17's right over there. We've got to get to an exit. Exit? The policeman. He may find a description of us posted somewhere. We'll be picked up at the first stop. We can't go back to the hotel. No, darling. We go to Grand Central Station. We're going to Rochester. Rochester. I have a wonderful friend there, Dr. Alex Bruloff. He was my professor at the university. He'll help us. Feel better? Uh, much better, thanks. Then let's pick up where we left off. We know you're a doctor, that you were in an accident, that you were once in Rome. I was never in Rome in my life. I... Yes. I... I remember. Fighter plane spotted us. You were flying? Transport, medical corps over Rome. What happened? Plane was hit, caught fire. Go on. I... I... I don't know. It, it, it just blacks out. You left the army after that? Maybe I deserted. I hated it. I hated the killing. I can remember that much. Your guilt fantasies were exaggerated by your duties in the stop army. Stop it. Stop it, please. I, I don't want to hear any more about it. Darling, we're just beginning. Don't hate me too much. Try to relax now. I'll tell you all about Alex, Dr. Bulo. Oh, you'll be crazy about it. Oh, 
Constance, oh, how good to see you again, my dear. Alex, you're busy. I should have let you know we were coming. And ruin this wonderful surprise. Now, who is this man? You are bringing me a new patient? Oh, no. This one's all mine. His name is John Brown. He is my husband, Alex. We were just married. Very glad to know you, Dr. Burloff. So, so, married. You know who is waiting for me in there? Two policemen. Policemen? This business about Dr. Edwards. They are here to ask me foolish questions. I get rid of them very fast now. I'm sure they didn't see us coming. I'm not going to run away again. Sure, we can hear what they're saying. I told the police before. I know nothing about it. Well, I some kind of a theory, Doctor. I said if Edwards took a paranoid patient along with him on a vacation, he was even a bigger fool than I thought he was. It's like playing with a loaded gun. Was Edwards a friend of yours? What are you talking about? I scarcely knew him. Now, please, no, no more questions. Sorry to have bothered you, Doctor. Good night. Oh, good night. Good night. Police detective. What do you suppose they are snooping around me for? <laughs> because you're so old and wise. Married, huh? Come on in the kitchen. We have a glass of beer. Hi, Alex. Uh, the truth is, we're here to impose the hotels. They're all so crowded, we couldn't get accommodations. What do you want with a hotel? I live by myself in a big house. Cook me my coffee in the morning, and the house is yours. Mr. Brown! Uh, yes? Make yourself useful. The beer! In the icebox. Oh, yes. Take your choice of the bedrooms, Constance. Good night. Good night, John. Night. Good night. Happy dreams, which we will analyze at breakfast. Thanks for everything. Any husband of Constance is a husband of mine. <laughs> so to speak. He is wonderful, isn't he? If we're supposed to be married, why didn't he ask where our luggage is? Alex is always like that, in a complete dream state, socially. Did the police upset you? Hmm? Oh, no. Oh, okay. You're very lovely. No, no, please. You'll keep this room. I'll take the one next door. It's the room I... John, what are you looking at? Nothing. You're staring at the curtains. Stop telling me what I'm doing. The curtains frighten you. White curtains with stripes. Stripes. Stop it. That night at the sanatorium, my dress was white with dark stripes. Why does the color white frighten you? Why do the lines frighten Just you? Just let me alone. Please let me alone. Yes, darling, yes. Why don't you take a hot bath? <sighs> You'll sleep better. Yes, I will. I, I'd like to shave. I, I, I must look like a tramp. Do you think you can manage one of those old-fashioned razors? Our host is an old-fashioned man. If I cut myself, I'll yell for my doctor. Good night, darling. Good night. White. White tiles. Lather, washbowl, medicine cabinet, bathtub, white. White, white. Uh, razor. Yes, this razor. Police, Brulov, Brulov, he knows, he knows. The razor. Is that you, John? Oh, join me. I was unable to sleep, so I came down to do some work. I am having some milk and crackers. Have some. There's plenty. Milk. White. White. John, what's the matter? What's that in your hand? What is it? Darling? Better get up, darling. Seven o'clock. John, are you awake? Gone. He's gone. John, where are you? Alex, are you down here? Where's the... The razor. The razor. Alex. Alex. Oh, no. No. Uh, what is it? Oh, good morning. Oh, are you 
You were asleep. What is the matter with you? Nothing. I must have dozed off in this chair. I get a cup of real coffee this morning. Alex, my husband. He Your isn't... husband's on the couch in the living room. You think Bruloff is so old he cannot make out two and two is four? I should have known. The moment I see you with a man whose pupils are enlarged, who has a tremor of the left hand, who is on a honeymoon with no baggage, and whose name is John Brown. Uh, I know practically what is going on. What did he do? Only what I expected. There is no use taking chances, so I sit here last night waiting. Soon he comes downstairs, and he is dangerous. I can see by his face, so I keep talking to him while I put some bromide in a glass of milk, enough to knock out three horses. The struggle against his condition. It agitates him at times, Alex. But there's no real danger. No real danger? Only he comes downstairs with my razor in his hand. What are you going to do? Something more for you than for me. Call the police. Oh, no, no. Please. Alex, you don't know this man. We are speaking of a schizophrenic, not a valentine. Please. The shock of a police investigation might ruin his chance for recovery. And I can save him. How if he killed Dr. Edwards? He didn't. He didn't. I couldn't feel this way towards a man who was bad, who had committed murder. I couldn't feel this pain for someone who was evil. This is baby talk. You are 20 times crazier than he is. Give me time. Just a few days, Alex. In his present condition, he could tell the police nothing. Don't you see? Go make me some coffee. Then you'll... Help me? Oh, Alex. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, you're awake. Who are you? Oh, yes, I... I remember. Constance. In the kitchen, making coffee. Hmm. Bromide. Who's been feeding me bromide? What's your name? I don't... Oh, Constance told you about me. Nobody had to tell me. And don't fight me. I'm going to help you if I can. I want you to look on me like your father. Trust me. Lean on me. This is a shortcut, but we haven't time for anything else. Go ahead. I'm leaning. Maybe you got something you want to tell me. A few words in the corner of your head. No. Go on, talk to me. There's nothing. Uh, maybe you've dreamt something. I was dreaming just now. What did you dream? I don't believe in dreams. That Freud stuff's a lot of hooey. Do you want I should help or not? I'm sorry. Dreams can tell you sometimes what you are trying to hide. But they tell it to you all mixed up. The problem is to put the puzzle together. Ah, Constance with the coffee. John, how do you feel? Awful. The patient is going to tell us about a dream. You'll find a pencil and pad on that table. Take notes. Well? Oh, the dream. I... I seem to be in a, in a gambling house. There weren't any walls, just a lot of curtains with eyes painted on them. I was playing cards with a man who had a beard. He had just won when the proprietor came in and accused him of cheating. The proprietor yelled at him. This is my place, he said. I won't allow you here. I'll fix you. Details, John. The more fantastic, the better. Oh, this man with a beard... He was leaning over the sloping roof of a high building, and I yelled at him to watch out, but he fell over slowly with his feet in the air. And then I saw the proprietor again. He was hiding behind a chimney, and he had a small wheel in his hand. I saw him drop the wheel on the roof. How did you react to that? I started running. I heard something beating over my head, a great, great pair of wings, and they almost caught me when I came to the bottom of the hill. I... I must have escaped. I, I, I don't remember. Then I woke up and saw Dr. Bruloff. Have some coffee. I, I feel so, so strange again. Something's happening to me. Try to relax. Drink your coffee. He's staring out the window. What's out the window? It's been snowing. The light frightened him. Photophobia. No. It's a snow. And those tracks in the snow. Dr. Edwards was fond of sports. He mentioned skiing in his book as valuable in the treatment of mental disorders. Skiing. That's what those dark lines symbolize for him. Ski tracks in the snow. 
John, where did Edwards go skiing? Can't you tell us where? He has already told us. Let me see your notes. Ah, sloping roof. That could mean a mountainside. And the bearded man was Dr. Edwards. Dr. Edwards plunged over the precipice while skiing. Those wings, chasing him down the hill. That could mean he was escaping from a valley. Skiing resorts often are called valleys, like Sand Valley. He was being pursued by a figure with wings. Wings? An angel? Angel Valley? John, do you remember an angel valley? No. We can call it travel agency. Check all the skiing resorts. It wasn't Angel Valley. It was... It was a... A place called Gabriel. Gabriel Valley. What else do you remember now? The uh, other man in your dream. The proprietor. Who was he? An accident occurred, darling. Do you remember that? A skiing accident. Dr. Edwards went over a snow cliff. It was no accident. I've had enough of this. Call the police. I killed him. I killed Dr. Edwards at Gabriel Valley. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of Spellbound will follow in a moment. Our guest tonight is responsible for the interviews with famous stars which many of you doubtless read in current publications. She's Miss Dorothy Blair of Universal International. Did you see any of the filming of Naked City at the studio, Dorothy? Yes, I did. After Mark Hellinger brought the company back from two and a half months on location in New York and did a few scenes at the studio. And there are more actual scenes of Manhattan in the picture than you could cover in a week of sightseeing. New York as native New Yorkers know it. Howard Duff and Dorothy Hart do outstanding jobs as the romantic leads. Barry Fitzgerald won everyone completely in his role of police lieutenant. Do you find that you have an eye for detail even when you're not working, Dorothy? Yes, I do. One day when I was on the set of Naked City, Dorothy Hart was having her hem adjusted. I found myself taking in every detail of her costume down to her stockings. The correct shade to blend with her costume, seam straight, but I can see John Kennedy knows the rest. No runs. That's right. <laughs> and every girl can give her precious nylons the same safe care the studios use. Gentle lux. It really cuts down runs. Well, there's a new thrill in store for women when they try the, the new tiny diamonds of lux. They're more wonderful than ever. They were a long time in coming, but now they're here. They're incredibly sheer and so tiny. There's nothing in the world just like them. They do more for you, too. In what way, Mr. Kennedy? They remove soil other kinds of suds can't, leaving things cleaner, fresher. I can hardly wait to get some. They make stockings last twice as long, too. Tests prove it. And that's just like getting an extra pair of stockings every time you buy a pair. Thank you for coming tonight, Dorothy Blair. Back now to our producer, William Keeley. Act three of Spellbound, starring Joseph Cotton as John and Valley as Constance. <laughs> John's statement that he has killed Dr. Edwards at Gabriel Valley has sent Constance to the telephone, but not to call the police. Constance, does the train leave, please? 4.45. Thank you. We're going to Gabriel Valley, John. There's a train in an hour. You're not going anywhere with me. I, I know about last night. I might have killed you or Dr. Bruloff with that razor. But you didn't. Nothing happened. It will if I don't give myself up to the police. I love you, but I'm not worth loving. Darling, you can help me, but afterwards... This feeling of guilt. Guilt. Have you never been without it? Not since childhood. What's that? Since childhood? What was it, darling? Was it so terrible that you preferred to think you murdered Dr. Edwards rather than remember what happened long ago? No, let me alone. You said you loved me. Look at me, then. Why am I fighting for you? Because I love you. Because I need you. How can you, you love me? And I want you to come with me to Gabriel Valley. What good will it do? You'll see the hill where it happened. 
You'll remember things. How I killed him. No, no. You'll see your innocence. You'll see what really happened. The episode's repeated. How, you, how do you know I won't kill again? Because I'm convinced you didn't kill in the first place. You... You believe in me enough to take such a chance? Of course I do. We'll go back to that Skiran. We'll find out what really happened to Dr. Edwards. We'll find out what it was in your childhood that's haunted you all these years. Dr. Broloff, you've been remarkably silent through all of this. This is a woman in love. What can an old man say? Hello? This is Lieutenant Cooley, Doctor, police headquarters. What do you want now? When I came to see you last Tuesday, you had visitors. One of them was a girl. Well? I've just received a bulletin from Vermont. They're looking for that girl, Constance Peterson. And what has she done? She's wanted for questioning. Where is she? She left yesterday afternoon. Where did she go? I don't know. You know what you're doing, don't you? Obstructing justice? Come down and arrest me there. Uh, I think I obstruct some more. This is long distance. A person to person call. Dr. Constance Peterson. She's at the inn in Gabriel Valley in Vermont. I'm sorry, sir. The inn at Gabriel Valley says Dr. Peterson has gone skiing. Do you wish her to call you when she returns? No. No. Never mind. You're sure this is the hill, John? You were here with Dr. Edwards. This is it. Put on your skis. The cliff, it's down there. I know it's down there. And promise me, no matter what I may try to do, you... The ski run curves away from the cliff. But what if I force you to... Just a few minutes, darling, and you'll be free. Take my hand. Ready? Then, here we go. Slow down. Slow down. We're going too fast. No, no, we're not. You're too close to me. Cut over. I want to be close the to you. Cliff, you can, you can see it now, just, just ahead of us. I know, darling. I know. Yes. I remember. I remember. Wait. Wait. He was where you are, and I... You wanted this. Everything must be the same. All right. Constance, no, no. Are you all right? Constance. Constance. You threw yourself at me. You wouldn't let me go over. You saved me. My... My brother. My, my, my brother. What about your brother? Tell me. We... We were children. It comes back to me now. I killed him. I, I killed my brother. It, it was an accident. Oh, what it, happened? It, How did it happen? Our house. The front steps. There was, there was a railing and... My brother was sliding down the railing. Tell me, I, you I, I must... didn't mean it. I didn't. I slid down behind him. I, I knocked him off. And there was a picket fence. My, my brother... At last. Oh. Come, darling. We're going back to the inn. You can call the police now. Yes. They can find the body of Dr. Edwards somewhere in the snow at the bottom of that cliff. <laughs> Some more coffee? Oh, please. The police should be there by now. We'll know very soon. Yes, darling. It's unbelievable how everything comes back to me. Oh, by the way, I'm not married, and my name is John. John Ballantyne. I'm very pleased to meet you. Another thing, my army record's all right. Medical discharge. How did you meet Dr. Edwards? Well, I met him in the Cumberland Mountains. I went there to rest. My nerves were still pretty ragged from the war, and he was vacationing there, and I asked him to help me. How did you happen to come here? I'm still a little hazy, darling. He invited me. A few days skiing. He was coming to Vermont anyway to take over the sanatorium. We had to change trains in New York and left the station. Went, went somewhere for lunch. I, I can't seem to recall just where. Anyway, uh, we came on, and 
the accident happened at that spot. Where you saved me. Now, now, let's not have any confusion about who saved whom. Edwards was about 50 feet ahead of me when he went over. You saw it happen. You thought of your brother, and that awful feeling of guilt came over you again. You had to run away. You assumed the role of Dr. Edwards to prove to yourself he wasn't dead. And since he wasn't dead, you reasoned you couldn't have killed him. How does it feel to be a great analyst? Wonderful. And madly adored. Very wonderful. Oh. I... Hello. I'm Sergeant Hickson, State Police. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is Lieutenant Cooley. He's from Rochester. We met Lieutenant Cooley before, so to speak. How did you find us, Lieutenant? No thanks to Dr. Brulow. But you left a trail a mile wide. We've found Dr. Edwards' body just where you said it would be. Thank goodness this is all over then. Not quite, Dr. Peterson. There was a bullet in his body. Well, that's impossible. Dr. Edwards was murdered. Shot in the back. You're under arrest. And I brought you back here to Green Manor's conscience because there is nothing more you can do for John. Alex, there must be something I can do. You cannot keep bumping your head against reality and saying the evidence is not there. The evidence is there. John has been indicted for murder. He trusted me, Alex. I, I led him into a trap. I've all but convicted him. Is that real enough for you? But don't ask me to stop. I can't stop. I won't stop until he's free. And how will you free him? I, uh, I don't know. I haven't seemed very grateful to Alex, have I? Thanks for straightening things out with Dr. Murchison and, and everyone. I'm sorry the prison hospital is so close by. This means you'll see John every chance you get. It is useless for me to tell you not to. Yes. I hate to hurry, Dr. Bruno. I have been waiting for you to throw me out of your office, Murchison. The car's here. It's quite a drive to the station. Uh, yes, I go back now to Rochester. Take care of my girl. We'll try to, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'll write to you, Constance. Thank you, Alex. A brilliant man. I, uh, I should go to the station with you. No, you're too tired. Uh, Constance... Try to forget things better forgotten. You have a fine career ahead of you here. Thank you. Well, at least one good thing came out of all this. You're still here. Who knows what would have happened to this place under Dr. Edwards? I knew Edwards only slightly. I never liked him. Well, good night, Constance. I hope you'll feel rested in the morning. Good night, Dr. Murchison. <laughs> I knew Edwards only slightly. I never liked him. He told me before he had never met him. The day John first came here. Like the rest of you, I've never met the man. Constance, did you forget something, my dear? I want to talk to you, Dr. Murchison. Well, of course. It's a problem. A dream one of my patients reported. In which patient? John Ballantyne. Well? Ever since John was arrested, he's been recalling more details of that dream. Anyway, he was playing cards in a gambling house, apparently with Dr. Edwards. Oh? What game were they playing? Twenty-one. John says he dealt Dr. Edwards of seven of clubs, and Edwards said that makes it twenty-one. Perhaps he was trying to mention a locale, an actual place, a club. There's a place in New York, the 21 Club. Oh, yes. Yes, so there is. The patient dreamed the proprietor accused Dr. Edwards of cheating. He ordered Edwards out. I won't allow you here, he said. This is my place. I'm going to fix you. The dream gives the locale a double identity. The 21 Club and Green Manners, perhaps. But the proprietor seems to belong to the latter. In fact, it... Might easily be myself. It seemed that way to me, Dr. Murchison. I presume you only arrived at this solution tonight? Yes, just now, in the corridor. Was there any more to the dream? Yes. The patient dreamed he and Dr. Edwards were on a high, sloping roof. That he saw Edwards fall from the roof to his death. He also saw the angry proprietor hiding behind a chimney. In his hand was a small wheel. He dropped the wheel. And the symbolism of the wheel escapes me. It was a revolver. The proprietor who threatened Edward's life in the 21 Club 
dropped a revolver in the snow at the Gabriel Valley after shooting Dr. Edwards in the back. The weapon is still there with the murderer's fingerprints on it. I can't agree with that part of your interpretation for the good reason that the weapon is now in my hand. I imagine something of this sort might happen when I made the slip before about knowing Edwards. That started your agile young mind going. You had a breakdown a few weeks ago. In your state of panic, you learned that Edwards was to take your place here. So you sought him out in his favorite restaurant in New York. He was having lunch there with John Valentine. You accused him of stealing your job. You threatened to kill him. You followed him to Gabriel Valley and shot him from behind a tree. You're an excellent analyst. But I don't think the police are interested in dreams. No, but they'll be greatly interested in the waiters in the 21 Club who saw you there. In the people who saw you on the train to Gabriel Valley. In others who saw you at the inn. There'll be no dreams in this case. And what did you think I'd do when you told me all this? Congratulate you? You forget in your devotion to your patient that the punishment for two murders is the same as for one. You're not going to commit a second murder, Dr. Murchison. I hadn't planned to. But you're here. You're not leaving. A man of your intelligence doesn't commit a stupid murder. You're thinking you were not mentally responsible the first time. That they'll consider the state of your health. That they'd never execute you for the murder of Dr. Edwards. You can still live, read, write, research, even if you are put away. You're thinking that now, Dr. Murchison. But if you pull that trigger, it's called deliberate murder. And you'll die in the electric chair for your crime. I... I'm going to telephone for the police, Dr. Murchison. If you walk to that door, I'll... And don't try to leave, Dr. Murchison. Sanatorium chief attempt to kill self after murder confession. Dr. Murchison's shot rival, Valentine Free. Girl risks life second time to save Valentine. Don't worry, Dr. Bruloff. This time it's, it's a real honeymoon. Luggage and everything. Nothing is so nice as a new marriage, John. No psychoses, no aggressions, no guilt complexes. Not yet. Not ever, Alex. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. And remember, John, for a happy marriage, never keep a secret from your wife. From her? A fat chance I'd have. Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. You know, Libby, we talk a lot about fashions and clothes. How about news tonight on fashions for the home? Well, there's a wonderful new fashion in dishes. Anything to do with color or size? In a way, because they're ever so tiny and pure, pure white. The dishes? <laughs> no, the new diamonds of Lux you use to wash them with. Washing dishes with this new Lux is a fashion I predict will sweep the country. Because these sheer tiny diamonds are so much faster? That's right. You just turn on the water and presto. They burst into suds right before your eyes. Just compare them with any other dishwashing suds you've ever used. They're richer. Make thick, abundant suds that last and last. They go so far, too. You can wash up to twice as many dishes with these new tiny diamonds of Lux. Careful tests using the same weight of soaps proved Lux washes more dishes than any of ten other leading soaps. And you needn't dry the dishes at all. Just rinse them with hot water and let them drain. They'll dry bright and sparkling. Of course, every woman knows how gentle Lux is, how kind to hands. You can be sure the new tiny Lux diamonds will keep your hands soft and smooth and lovely in spite of dishwashing. Try these new tiny Lux diamonds for dishes tomorrow. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Our thanks now to Joseph Cotton and Valley, who returned to the footlights for a well-earned curtain call. (laughs) 
Our congratulations to you both for your splendid performances in Spellbound. Thank you, Bill. It's always always a pleasure to be here, but you know it was a double pleasure tonight. Oh, why is that, Joe? Well, to be with Alita Valley on her very first dramatic radio broadcast, and I'm sure you agree with me that she is to be highly congratulated for her performance tonight. Indeed, yes. Were you nervous, Miss Valley? A little, I suppose. But you can help feeling right at home after the first few minutes. And I'm delighted, of course, that my very first radio performance has taken place on America's leading dramatic radio program. Well, I hope, Miss Valley, that tonight's appearance will be the first of many on our Lux Radio Theater. See, I told you this was a nice program, Alita. Well, you must like it. You've been back three times this year already. <laughs> well, that's right, Joe. You're practically a permanent fixture with us. I trust you've had time to do a picture or two for your boss, David O. Selznick, though. He certainly has. He's just completed a wonderful picture with Jennifer Jones called Portrait of Jenny. And speaking of pictures, Miss Valley, I enjoyed your performance as Mrs. Paradine in the Paradine case very much. Thank you. You're very kind. What's doing in the Lux Radio Theater next week, Bill? Next Monday night, in honor of St. Patrick's Day, we're bringing our audience one of the gayest, most tuneful musicals to reach the screen. It's 20th Century Fox's great hit, Irish Eyes Are Smiling. Starring Dick Hames in his original screen role, co-starred with the delightful Gene Crane. Well, that ought to make a great day for the Irish, Bill. And everybody else. Good night. Good night. Good night, and thanks again for Spellbound. <laughs> and now it's my privilege to make a very special announcement. The name you ladies have been waiting to hear. The first prize winner of the third week of Lever Brothers Mammoth Fur Contest. A $3,000 mink coat or cash, if she prefers, goes to a lady in Lafayette, Indiana. And her name is Mrs. Janice C. Urselcook of 907 State Street. Congratulations, Mrs. Urselcook, on your fine letter. Here are the second prize winners for the third contest. Mrs. Robert S. Oaks, of 819 South Columbus Street, Alexandria, Virginia, Mrs. Gladys Dorothy Johnson, 3642 Huntington Avenue, Minneapolis 16, Minnesota, and Miss Joan L. Smith of 537 West Deming Place, Chicago, Illinois. A $1,000 fur coat or cash to each. Other winners will be notified by mail. Listen next week for the name of the top winner of the fourth Big Lever Fur Contest. It may be yours. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Crane and Dick Hames in Irish Eyes Are Smiling. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Red Cross stands ready to serve you and your community. Keep Red Cross prepared when disaster strikes. Give gladly to the 1948 Red Cross Fund. Heard in our cast tonight were Herbert Butterfield as Bruloff, Bill Johnstone as Murchison, Gerald Moore as Fleureau, and Cliff Clark as Cooley. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear... Irish Eyes Are Smiling with Dick Hames and Gene Crane. Pepsodent won by three to one. Yes, in a recent survey, families throughout America compared new Pepsodent toothpaste with the brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming average of three to one, they preferred new Pepsodent with Irium over any other brand they tried. They said new Pepsodent toothpaste tastes better makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Irish Eyes Are Smiling with Gene Crane and Dick Haynes. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>